Goed, goeiedag 1GT1 um, studenten. Welkom bij jullie module voor uh, semester 1. Jullie zullen hoor ek gesels eerst met jullie in Afrikaans. En zodra ons bij die klas gezelf komt, zal ons oorschakel naar Engels toe. Ek hou echter al van om in beide talen te praten, want ik voel uh, jullie verstandhouding als niet noodwendig Engels eerste taalsprekers. Uh, nie is baie beter as ek um, tussen die twee tale gaan en dit is dan ook in lijn met um, hoe ons uh, julle aanmoedig om die kinders in die klas te leer dat jy terug gaan na die, na die moedertaal toe en die nie kunt sikkel uh, in die tweede taal. Oké, okay. ek um, begin daar op die module uitkomstes, julle sal sien dis in julle studiegids. Um, dis net om julle bykie achtergrond te gee rondom dit uh, wat jullie in hierdie module gaan leer en natuurlijk gaan lees ook uh, wat jullie hopelijk al klaar gedoen het en daar ook zelfs al klaar um, na Dead Poet Society uh, gekyk het. Die eerste um, module uitkomste daar sê Analyze set forms of literature using recognizable formulated techniques and practices Dit beteken jij gaan die teksten, dit is nou Lord of the Flies en Dead Poet Society gaan jij op een bepaalde manier analyseer en een bepaalde mening daarover uitspreek binnen een bepaalde raamwerk. Dit is wat ek vir jou gaan leer in die module. Dit help je dan ook als je gaan school gee om op een specifieke manier naar teksten te kyk um, en uh, dit te kies ook. Daar, uh, die volgende een wat daarop volg, is critically evaluate and judge set forms of literature based on formulated techniques and practices. Dit is wat ik nou net vir julle gesê het. Dan nummer 3, incorporate the above skills of analysis in their, uh, in their own teaching. Dit is nou jylle wat hulle nou verwijst daar. Uh, in the immediate, intermediate phase uh, as the situation demands. Jy gaan nie noodwendig hierdie tekste in die intermediaire fase gebruik nie. Ek kan jy dit verseker. Jy sal wel dit, as jy in een hoorfase uh, school geeft, sal jy dit wel uh, kan gebruik. Maar het is net om jou bykie boor die kinders te laat uitstuig in termen van wat jy weet en hoe jy nou goed is gekyk dat jy nie als een professionele uh, schoolkind by, die, by die school instap en waar jy eindelijk uh, uh, van hoerkennis, um, oor hoerkennis moet beskik. Ok, the next one nie, be equipped to exhibit appreciation for English literature by independently writing a literary essay. Dit is iets waar het ons gaan werk, hoopelik, uh, as jy uh, verstaan met aangaan en weet wat jy doen, dan uh, het jy ook een beetje waardering en geniet jy dit ook om dit te doen. Recognize the necessity of literature and its application to the, in, the, in, the, in the intermediate phase in developing the four skills dictated by the CAPS document. Dit is een uh, module uitkomste daai wat jy eindelijk recht dier jou uh, jylle Engelse um, modules uh, um, na, moet, na moet kyk. Want as jy na die CAPS document kyk, sê jy sien, hulle begin elke keer hulle twee weke cyclus met die tekst. So daai ding is universeel wat, uh, of het nou Engels of Afrikaans is wat dit betref. Uh, daai pinkie wat jy daar, uh, of daai module uitkomste wat ons daarna verwijs. Dan die derde laaste een, die deuce and compare the vast differences between various liter literature texts, prose, poetry, drama and film and the different grades within the intermediate phase that deal with it. In hierdie module gaan jy na prosa kyk, jou uh, Lord of the Flies en na film, jou Dead, uh, Dead Poets Society, um, jy het reeds uh, een GT221 onder die belt wat ons na die ander tekste ook gekyk het. Hier focus ons net specifiek op die twee. Ons sal eigenlijk al vier so wil gedoen het uh, in hierdie type, uh, in hierdie type uh, context, maar ons het net soveel tyd, so ons focus specifiek op prosa uh, en op film. Dan weer een algemene, die tweede laaste met die uitkomste, use knowledge of childhood development between grade 6 of 4 to 6 with specific focus on identifying the educational needs of the learners. Dit geld recht hier, ek wil amper sê vir jou, um, vir jou jylle kursus, uh, geld daai uh, een, ons sit om net hierby om te wees hy geld oor ons. En dan lastens, identify and differentiate between methods of naturally and enjoyably integrating the teaching of literature to cater for a variety of learners and circumstances. Tot op hierde het jy eindelijk baie daai met die uitkomste um, uitgeleef van geleer en um, nou focus ons specifiek op die literatuur en gee ons net bykie verdere achtergrond uh, daaraan. Goed, voor ons enigszins verder gaan, ek sit net gauw die powerpoint aan, um, 
dit is belangrijk dat als jij uh, iets wil weten oor die module, als jy uh, onzeker is oor iets, uh, vooral met die type module wat baie van julle tientje neem, dit die eerste keer een uh, uh, meer ernstige analyse van literatuur doen, uh, uh, a serious analysis of literature, La, vraag asjeblief dadelijk as jy vasthak. Ek het die forum geskep op e-klas soos jy in gisterse e-post uh, gesien het, waar jy vraag kan gaan vraag rondom dit wat ons vandag of hierdie week in die klas leer. Um, ek gaan in die forum kyk, ek gaan vraag antwoord. Uh, as jy een vraag naam of vir een student, ander student kan antwoord, doen het asjeblief, dan leer ons ook saam uh, om, uh, om die, die module onder die knie te kry. Belangrike ding, as jy een dringende navraag het, Bedoel, bedoelende, jy moet binnen die volgende paar ure antwoord hee, um, dan e-post dit direct na my, daar is my e-post. As dit een navraag is wat jy bereid is om vir een dag of twee te wacht, dan kan jy dit gerust e-post um, na die um, module tutor toe. Ek gaan nou vir die besonderhede daarvan um, gee. Goed, daar is ons dit ook. Die meis is nou bykie vinnig vir my, excuus. Daar is het weer, daar is my uitbreiding telefoon, onthou, die docente is nie wenig op campus, as gevolg van COVID regulaties nie. So, as jy gelukkig is, ga jy my dalkie kry, maar jy boos my dalkie eerder, want dan ga jy my definitief in die handen kry. Die tutor is mevrou Rolien Bischof, daar is haar uitbreiding. As jy iets wil vraag, wat vir die dag of toe kan wacht, voordat jy antwoord nodig het, dan kan jy gerust vir haar, jy boos of enige ander navraag, kan jy aan haar rug. Ok, kom ons beweeg verder aan, daar is die asserings rooster, soos julle kan sien, die e-klas toets, of die eerste e-klas toets, dit gaan een inhouds toets wees, gaan, of moet, of gaan, is geskiet die leer om in te gee, in die 20ste van februari, en gaan julle echter, tot die dinsdag van die week gee, ek denk is die 23ste, omdat ons, eerst die naweek gaan klaarmaak met, hoe het klaar te maak met die laatste studie eenheid. Ek het echter ook gesê dat ek die twee studie eenhede saam gaan gee, dat dit beter geïntegreerd is, dat jy jou, ja, ek sal dit nou met julle bespreek, jou semester opdracht, ek sal om binnen die volgende week vir julle probeer laai, ek wil net bykie gaan, soos die Engelsman sal sê, fine tune, van laas jaar af, hy gaan bykie anders wees as laas jaar sin, hy moet asjeblief die 17e april via toen het in ingehandig word. Goed, as jy enige vraag hier oor het, jy post my geris, en dan kan ek jou op plek help. Ok, what are we going to do today? Two basic things. As I said, I have integrated study unit 1 and 2, because I feel you learn better the terms that I speak of here, Uh, when you have the text that you refer to that you are studying yourself, then me teaching you the terms uh, in a separate study unit uh, independently. Then we're also going to discuss the background uh, to Lord of the Flies. Okay, so, jylle gaan sien, daar gaan skyfies wees oor achtergrond, en dan gaan daar tussen in skyfies wees oor terme. Waar is a voorbeeld in Lord of the Flies van hierdie term wat ek bespreek? Okay, let's get to the serious stuff. Oh, there's module uh, outcomes that I've discussed uh, as well. So I should have removed that slide, but uh, let's not worry about that now. Okay, firstly, Aros is a, a Christian uh, college which um, prides itself in saying we teach from a Christian perspective. Now, studenten, ek moes al vir julle gesê het, ek het um, vroeger het ek die grondslagfase sy lit, literatuur met die leuk aangebied, en het een paar ouwers hier gekry wat amper op hysteries is, wat vir my sê, hoe kan jy syke tekste gee by een christelike instantie? Onthou asjeblief, as ons praat van christen perspektief, dan sê ons ook, ons beoordeel die wereld vanuit die christen perspektief. Ons probeer nie die wereld met die christen perspektief, met die christen kwasi smeer, en dit is nie waar oor het gaan nie. Ons herken dat ons is in die wereld, maar nie van die wereld nie, en dat ons in die sondige wereld leef, en die tekst wat ons mee bezig is, is een typische voorbeeld daarvan, die story wat vertel word, en ons gaan nou bykie kyk hoe dit werk, ek wil een paar punte rondom dit noem, so hou dit in gedachte wanneer jy dit lees, en jy wonder oor of jy, jy wonder oor wat sy perspektief jy hierdie na moet kyk ok, if you look specifically at themes from Lord of the Flies firstly, ehm 
man's inherent evil to do sin, uh, which happened after the fall of man in Genesis. So met ander woorde, ongehoorzaamheid aan die Heere, wat al die paar daar in Genesis gebeur het, is typisch wat ons hier in Lord of the Flies uh, ook sien, want het het gaan oor die mens um, se, uh, uh, se strewe om soos God te wees. I also make that point in the second um, uh, uh, bullet there, man's desire to be God, um, we see this through the building of weapons that will destroy the earth, nuclear weapons, atom weapons, and of course this is an allusion uh, to the great flood in Genesis, Noach's flood, wat ons van lees, as well as the end days of the destruction in Revelations. Now the belangrike ding, wat ons moet verstaan as ons so stelling maak is, ons sê nie, dit is wat William Golding bedoel het nie, verseker nie, maar ons as christene, dit, dit herinner ons daar aan, ok, uh, dit is belangrijk, want Golding het die typische menselijke situasie gevat, uh, en een story rondom dit gebouw, uh, en vanuit die bybelse perspektief is dit, uh, hoe ons hierdie situasie wat hy gevat het, uh, na kan kyk. The third bullet is, is man's total conceding to sin, even from a young age. Um, die titel in zichzelf, ek gaan het nou nie met julle bespreek, uh, Lord of the Flies, kom van die Hebrewse woord Beelzebub, uh, wat die Hebrewse woord, natuurlijk die oorzakelijke taal van die Bijbel, oorspronkelijke taal van die Bijbel, dit is die Hebrewse woord vir die duivel. Ok, um, so dit is waar dit vandaan kom, so jy speel die heel tijd met die ondertoene uh, rondom uh, uh, type die mens op sy eie met die, met die amper over God verlatenheid op hierdie op hierdie ei, eiland, nie dat dit, dit uh, net wenig so is. So selfs van een jong ouderdom af, uh, is die mens geneig tot zonde. Then the fourth bullet there, man's tendency to commit idolatry in the perceived absence of God. Idolatry beteken afgodsdienst, hier so verwijs ons specifiek um, na die, um, die priest wat hulle van praat um, in die, in die, um, in die tekst self, um, en dit kan dan ook, of een voorbeeld van die Bijbel wat ons ook sien, as ons vergelijk hoe die twee stories uh, parallel um, afgespeel het, the illusion of course to the golden calf uh, in Exodus, because the, um, the people of Israel felt that God had disappeared, Moses didn't come back, and so they made this golden calf uh, to uh, bow before. So jylle kan die raakpunt het is in mekaar daar gaan sien. Uh, as ons met een christen bril of een christen perspektief daarna kyk. Oké, okay. um, excuse hier, die muis beweeg baie vinnig. Um, daar sê, just to give you, you an idea of what we mean with an illusion, that is also the first term that I'd like you to uh, know, and I will be, this will be asked amongst others in the E-class test, is an illusion is a reference to a well-known person, a place, an event, a literary work, or a work of art to enrich the reading experience by adding meaning. Let's have a look at the example first. If someone says, don't act like a Romeo in front of her, that Romeo is a specific reference to Romeo, uh, the passionate lover of Juliet in Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Okay, amal weet, of tenminste binnen die westerse context, weet ons wie Romeo is, so as ek sê, moet nie soos een Romeo wees, dan weet jy precies waarvan ek praat, dan wil dit beteken, moet nie jouself so um, verlief voor een persoon gedra nie. Ok, so, when I spoke about illusions in the previous slides, it means references to another text, as you can see there, another place, ok, or even uh, an event. All these things you also find uh, in the Bible. So that's the first term um, you need to know. The reason why I've put um, that slide there is because I refer to an illusion um, in the introduction regarding the Christian perspective. Okay, let's move on to the background. And then we also have a look at some literary terms and concepts. Now firstly, the best way to start with the background of any novel, any literary piece is to have a look at who the author is and who the author is or was in real life. Now, as you would know by now, the author of Lord of the Flies is William Golding. He was born in the 18th um, century, or the 20th century, sorry, uh, in England, 1911 to be exact, and he passed away in 1993. He was also a teacher uh, before he became a writer. He started off with teaching. So there's an immediate association with you guys as well. His experience as teacher, this is, this is quite ironic, showed him that children can be very cruel to one another, okay? He was also in the British Navy during the Second World War, 
Um, and because of this, he saw the type of destruction and the cruelty of war uh, that happened, and he brought these two things together uh, in Lord of the Flies. Um, he came to the conclusion, because of what he saw in his class and because of what he saw during his service in the war, that all human beings are capable of extreme evil. This is telling what they mark. This is not a good thing. We gaan kijken hoe kom dit uitgelewe word uh, in Lord of the Flies. Okay, the next thing I can tell you about Golding is, he also believed that through laws and society and personal self-control, that people could stop themselves from acting out the evil in their natures. Now, as ons kyk na laws of the society and personal self-control, ons bron vanuit die christelike perspektief, is natuurlijk die bybel rondom dit, Julle kan ook uh, mooi gaan lees uh, in die Bijbel, wat die Bijbel sê rondom uh, staats, mag en staats beheer, wat natuurlijk ook baie keer van woordelik is vir wette in die samenleving. Um, but then also the Bible gives us a guidelines to personal self-control, especially uh, not just in the New Testament, in the letters of Paul, but also in the Old Testament. There's the, the point I made also um, of the, the name of, um, or one of the names of Satan the devil in Hebrew is Beelzebub, which means Lord of the Flies. So that explains the title uh, uh, to us uh, as well. We can say uh, 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 Golding used this name for the title of the novel because he wanted to show that evil is found in the hearts of people who behave in a cruel and savage ways. Uh, and I think it's also important uh, to understand that he, in his story, he creates uh, uh, a society, the island, where Firstly, there are younger children who have had no guidance or very little guidance from adults who are governing themselves, regeer hulle self, and then uh, they have this evil, uh, or this evil in their heart starts to, um, uh, uh, comes to fruition. Met ander woorde, dit, uh, dit is soos een saaiki wat geplant is, en as jy hierdie saaiki dier die um, wette van die samenleving uh, van kleins af onderdruk en nie, en nie, en amper half doodmaak, Dan behoor die kind nie as, uh, uh, the child uh, wouldn't manifest as evil as an adult. But this hasn't happened yet uh, in the short lives uh, of the children. Okay, let's move on. The first thing in terms of literary term, ons het nou weer hier met term te doen, uh, is language and style. Okay, now each and every author of elk, uh, elke skrywer het een specifieke uh, manier van skryf en een specifieke stijl ook. Dit het te doen met die taal wat hy of sy gebruik en so voorts. That's exactly what I said there on the slide as well. It's a distinctive way that a writer uses language. It can include factors such as word choice, sentence length, arrangement and complexity, and the use of figurative language and imagery. Figurative language, things like metaphors, personification, similes, um, jy krijg dit nie nie uitwendig net in poesie nie. And then imagery, of course, vergelijkings wat getre word, dat die leeser kan verstaan precies wat uh, die skryver wil sê. If we then move on, um, language and style, um, there's a formal definition for it there, as you can see. The way the writer writes uh, and uh, the techniques which an individual author uses in his writing. Um, Persoonlijk denk ek, Golding, The Lord of the Flies, is nog een relatieve makkelijk verstaanbare tekst en die manier wat hy skryf. Uh, ek kan self onthou, ons het op universiteit een van sy ander um, tekste gedoen en het was rarig nog een uitdaging um, om te lees. Maar uh, dit nou daar gelaat. Ok. The next, or the example that I can give you about language and style, uh, language and style comes directly from uh, a novel I taught to grade fours when I was still a teacher. That novel's name was... Um, um, the sheep pig, of soos die fliek sê bekend was, was Bijb. En hier is ons een voorbeeld van hoe, ek kan nou nie onthou wat die, wat die boer vir as naam is nie, hoe sy typisch gepraat het, met ander woorde, hoe die auteur sy tekst gevorm het, en die, met die bepaalde achtergrond. And I'm going to try and read it to you, and you'll understand what that tells us about the, um, the character. Uh, in, the, in the book, she was someone that was uh, quite, uh, always in a rush, Never, looks, never looked as if she had enough time, uh, and she speaks like that as well. <clears throat> so that, here goes. I thought it was a pig. I said to, to myself, that's a pig. That is only nobody around here do keep pigs. It's all sheep for miles about. 
what's a pig doing? I said to myself, anybody think that was killing the poor thing? Have a look when you take all this stuff down, which you better do now. Come and give us a hand. It can go in the back of the Land Rover. It isn't raining. It won't work. Wipe your boots before you come in. Okay. So da, hoor ons, hierdie vrou is in die algemeen, bykie die mekaar, en sy doen 4 of 5 goeders um, gelijk. Okay. So we can see this. How can we see this? Firstly, she doesn't um, pause. She doesn't pause for new sentences. She just adds commas. Um, this is similar to how some of you sometimes still write. Instead of using a full stop, you use a comma. Um, she carries on. She mentions she heard a pig. She mentioned that uh, in the area there's only sheep. Um, and she said it sounds like someone is killing the thing. And then yeah, at the end she says, because um, she's speaking to her husband, her husband must put something in the Land Rover uh, and it's not raining anymore and he needs to wipe his boots before he comes in. So this typically describes or gives, gives us an idea of the type of character that the um, farmer's wife is. Uh, uh, and um, the author of The Sheep Pig did that by writing her speech or the, the things she says in this uh, manner. Good, come as we on. Then in terms of language and style, there are a number of styles. I'm going to show you all of them and I'm going to specifically tell you which style you can find uh, in Lord of the Flies. Firstly, you've got your exploratory, uh, exp expository or argumentative style. Uh, the author uh, uh, writes on a specific uh, subject um, and um, they leave their own opinion about that subject. This is not something that you deal with um, in this uh, module. Secondly, you've got the persuasive style, very closely related to the expository style. Um, typically, you'll find that uh, in ads and people that are trying to convince you of something. Um, this is also not something that you'll see in this module. You touched briefly on that uh, in uh, ENGT um, 221. If we move on, you've got the narrative style. Now, the narrative style is typically what you find uh, in Lord of the uh, Flies, and typically it you'll find in uh, Dead Poet Society uh, as well. Okay, the author chooses a person to tell a story. We're going to look at the the, the, um, the uh, uh, different tellers of the story or the narrators uh, in a brief while, um, but typically the narrative style has to do with a story that starts at point A and ends at point Z, uh, and all the detail is all the other letters in between. Uh, we're going to look at what this looks like as well uh, before we get uh, to Lord of the Flies uh, in itself. Okay, we can also find this in short stories, in novels, in biographies, uh, and poetry. Typically in a biography, uh, the um, book will start, although it's nonfiction, it'll start where um, whoever the biography is about, where the person was born and end typically uh, with the latest um, event in the person's life. Um, that could be, of course, he, uh, his or her death. Okay. The next term that I'd like to discuss with you is historical context. Uh, we've briefly touched on some of the historical context uh, with the introduction uh, of William Golding, but um, it typically uh, tells us also when the text was written. Now, Lord of the Flies was written in the middle 50s. Um, what, this is, what the society at the time was like that the text was written, I'm going to discuss that um, just after this. Who or what influenced the writer? We've touched on that uh, with the background to Golding. And what political or social influences there would have been. That is very important in terms of the historical context of Lord of the Flies uh, as well. And I'm going to explain that uh, in a moment. I can do in a moment with you to speak. Okay. Setting, what baie met die historische context ook te doen kan he. Setting, this simply refers to where uh, the action of the story uh, takes place. And as I mentioned there, it is often linked to historical uh, context. Okay. Let's have a look at a bit of the social and political background uh, of which, um, or which, uh, Lord of the Flies seeks to represent. Okay, we've mentioned that uh, Golding um, uh, served during the Second World War. Now, this period is supposedly just after this. The story is not af net na die Tweede Wereldoorlog. In die van julle wat bykie in die geschiedenis delf, weet, uh, ten die einde van die oorlog, en ons gaan nou kyk hoekom, het Amerika twee atoombome teen Japan gebruik, 
uh, en dit is natuurlijk iets aan bewapen wat massa vernietiging veroorzaak het, en iets wat die wereld nog nooit ge- uh, uh, gesien het uh, van tevoren. Oké, okay. uh, so hou dit net in gedachte, uh, die achtergrond vir Lord of the Flies is, hierso is een kernoorlog of een of atoomoorlog wat gaan uitbreek, na die, in die tijd na die Tweede Wereldoorlog, en dit gaan, um, of dit het al uitgebreek, en dit gaan die, die, die kinders word weggevoerd, want dit is een gevaar. I've mentioned that uh, Golding served in the Second World War, and the Second World War in itself saw the, the death of 60 million people, both soldiers and um, uh, 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 um, civilians. Okay? Uh, this war was characterized by two events. Dit was natuurlijk die grootste oorlog in die wereldse geschiedenis. Uh, firstly, the evil nature of one man, uh, Adolf Hitler, being turned into a state mechanism of Germany. So, Basis dit wat uh, Hitler gevoel het, dit sy politieke oortuigings, het hy, as jy die geschiedenis ken, het hy uh, stadig maar seker het hy in Duitse beleid ingebring, tot die, sy partij die nazi's naderhand oorgeneem het, uh, en hulle dit op mense begin uh, um, afdoen het. An example of this, is the death of 11 million undesirables. Nie soldaten nie, gewone mense soos ek en jy, maar wat in die oe van die Duitsers, of van die nazi's, as um, uh, uh, benede mense uh, gesien is. Um, um, and these people included Jews, of course, of which we know there 6 million Jews died in the German concentration camps, like Auschwitz, Treblinka, Sobibar, uh, but also people with disabilities, uh, certain um, religious groups, in ek praat van christelike groep, ek praat nie van um, metwendig uh, nie christelike geloof nie, behalwe nou die uitsomming, die uitsomming van die jode, um, uh, 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 people of color, um, ja, uh, as jy enigszins nie binnen die bepaalde raamwerk van die uh, nazi propaganda geval het nie, uh, is jy as a, a undesirable um, uh, um, geklassificeer en as jy gelukkig was, kon jy dat ook nog uh, in een van die kampen gaan werk het, maar eventueel so jy in elk geval uh, ook doodgemaak uh, gewees het. So, you would typically have found yourself in the concentration camps like Auschwitz, Trebelinka and Sobibor. Um, there are many more of them, of course. So this is the background, or this is one of the things that happened. This, the, the other thing that happened during the war uh, is, if you know your history, uh, Hitler and Germany and uh, Germany's ally Italy were eventually defeated in Europe. Okay. Hulle is so in May van 1945, is die Tweede Wereldoorlog in Europa en in oorlogs waar die Europeers bekleid is dit tot die einde gebring. Uh, the, 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 the point that needs to be made here is Japan was still actively engaged in war uh, against the United States or the Allies in specific, the British as well, uh, in the specific, in the Pacific, uh, and he still it was here. The Americanus or the Americans uh, had not invaded uh, the Japanese home islands yet. And the thing that typically defined the Japanese is they were prepared to fight to the death. They'd rather commit suicide than surrender. So the Americans realized that this was going to be a, a battle or, or, or the rest of the war would cost a lot of American uh, lives. Um, typically, well, they say they're hundreds of thousands. And they decided we need to end this war as quickly with Japan. Otherwise, this is going to cost us too many wars. Now, during the Second World War, the, the development of atomic weapons was already underway. In the end, um, the Americans won the race of discovery against the Germans. Uh, America developed an atomic bomb. And in the end, in August the 6th and August the 9th, um, atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima on the 6th and Nagasaki uh, in Japan. And as you can see there in brackets, 150,000 immediate deaths in Hiroshima and uh, 75,000 immediate deaths in Nagasaki. And eventually that persuaded the, the Japanese to unconditionally um, surrender. Okay, the belangrijke reden hoe kom ons dit vir julle noem is, is dit is die type achtergrond waarmee Golding gewerk het, dit is die type griewel wat hy gesien het, en dit is wat hy ook verwoord in Lord of the Flies. Okay. The other thing that we must note about atomic warfare of atoombome of kern weapons is it, it kills some people immediately. But because there is radiation, okay, um, 
die, die energie wat die, wat die, wat die, 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 die chemische uh, uh, goed wat hulle gebruik om die bom te vervaardig afgee, they are, uh, uh, people uh, uh, become ill as well. In Hiroshima en Nagasaki, if I quickly make, um, uh, do my math there, there was approximately another 400,000, um, between 300,000 people, additional people that died after the blast. So not from the blast itself, because of radiation sickness. Babas wat misvorm gebore is as gevolg van hierdie radioactiviteit waarin hulle ouders blootgestel is. Ok, so Golding took note of all of this. Now after the Second World War, a new type of war started, which was called the Cold War. Gaan die koude oorlog nou vir die rikkie verduidelik. But the crux of the Cold War is the victors of the Second World War, in other words America, Britain, France, and the Soviet Union, which vandaag Rusland is, all acquired atomic weapons. Met andere woorde, wapens, wat, as hulle die mekaar te staan gekom het, sal hulle mekaar uitgewis het in die aarde daarmee saamgevat. Ok, as a result of this, there were two ideologies, twee ideologieën. Ok, on the one hand, you had capitalism, which we, to a certain extent, is still, we still see in South Africa, die vrye mark stelsel, met ander woorde, jy kan jou eie bezigheid gaan opstel, en jy kan tegen ander mense kompeteer, en as jy geld maak, goed vir jou, as jy nie geld maak nie, dan moet jy maar by oor begin, of jy gaan in armoede verval. As opposed to the communism, or communist system, in the Soviet Union, where the state controls everything. They tell you what job you need to do, how much you get paid, die, they pay you, die, die salaries of various professions are mostly the same, so you'll, let's say for example, someone like, that drives a bus will get basically the same salary as someone who is a medical doctor. Okay, so these two ideologies, hierdie twee ideologieën, competed against each other for world domination. There was never a direct conflict between these countries that um, uh, were pro-capitalism and the Soviet Union which was pro-communism but there was the constant threat of an atomic war okay now what did it we can't do it we do here to sell it a lot of the world to be able to spread so typically you would have smaller wars between opposing sides of these uh, to um, ideologies, okay, the Americans and the Russia was not directly about the talking, the Americans and the Soviets were not directly involved, but each of them would support various sides, okay, an example of that, the Korean War, which followed soon after the Second World War, where you had uh, a, a Korean Civil War between a, a, a Korean Burger Oorlog, between a, a, a capitalist faction and a communist faction, so the major powers got involved there. The Vietnam War, in which the Americans were directly involved, where they fought communism. Uh, and even the South African border war, the South African Grens Oorlog, what baie, baie van jylle paas, wat ook nog weer mag toegegaan het, dit was as gevolg van hierdie oorlog, wat hulle moest opleiding kry, as gevolg van die communistische bedreiging, wat Zuid-Afrika bedreig het, uh, vanuit Angola uit, uh, wat dier Rusland en al die communistische state geondersteun is. Ok, the important thing to also note is no nuclear weapons were ever used in this tension time. Ok, so geen verdere kernwapens is gebruik om oorlog meer te voer. Dit is belangrijk om dit te onthou. So, met hierdie achtergrond is waar Lord of the Flies afspeel, die verskil is net daar was nou een kernoorlog en die kinders word word ontruim uit waar hulle blij en hulle kom op hierdie eiland aan waar die hulle vliegtuig het geval of was een skip ek kan nou nie precies onthou nie en hulle kom op hierdie eiland aan en dit is net hulle wat op hierdie eiland is en dan kyk ons wat gebeur daarna ok, the next thing which you must also keep in mind en hou asjeblief jou christen perspektief rondom dit is The world in general, and I'm saying Europe and America, in an body oorlog of oorlogs plaas gevind het, die tweede wereld oorlog. The world in general was in a state of shock. 60 miljoen mense is verskrikkelijk baie. Om jou idee te gee, 
uh, die COVID-19 infecties het nou wereldwijd net oor een miljoen mense doodgemaak. So 60 miljoen is omtrent 60 keer COVID soos wat het uh, um, uh, tot op hier staan. So the world was in, uh, in a state of shock. Baie van die Europeers, uh, en dit, dit het ek al baie oor gelees, het eenvoudig gevra, hoe kon iets so verskrikkelijk gebeur het as daar een God is? So dit is waar baie van Europa sy um, sy uh, 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 um, uh, atheisme begin het. Okay. One of the philosophies that underpin this atheism uh, of especially the Europeans was known as nihilism. It was developed by a, or, 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 yeah, developed by a, a German um, philosopher known as Friedrich Nietzsche who had already died by the, before 1900, okay, but it became popular again. And nihilism basically said that everything is devoid of meaning. Can you understand this background, this, uh, hoe, as ons met a christelijke achtergrond naar kijk, and see ons, uh, die Heer Christus, of die Heer die Heere, het alles betekenis. Nihilism says, everything is devoid uh, of meaning. So it was typically this atmosphere, about things that happened, that uh, interested Golding, and we, he had a look at why it made people violent, and why they fight each other, and he put this together uh, in this uh, story. Okay, but let's get to the detail. Let's first look at the characters of Lord of the Flies. I can begin by the characters, and then I can also tell you what what betekent the term characterization uh, you see. Oh, nee, I begin with characterization. Now, firstly, I read to you earlier, I gave you the example about uh, uh, language and style. Uh, language and style also plays a role in how um, the author uh, writes his character, creates his character. And we say that in the definition, it specifically refers to techniques a writer or an author uses to create and develop a character by what he or she does or says. Think about the farmer's wife from uh, the sheep pig. What the other, other characters say about him or her, or how they react to him or her, and then what the narrator tells us directly about the character. Here is by example that by good after come in the the opening of the Lord of the Flies, where the verteller um, Ralph and Piggy with each other vergelijk. He verduidelijks of he of she verduidelijks specific to their physical eigenschappen work. Okay, so that is the formal definition of characterization. Let us now, uh, before we carry on um, with, with the characters themselves, it's important that you also understand that there are two types of characters in any um, uh, literature uh, text. Firstly, you get the antagonistic characters. That is, with other words, the slechte ou in the in story. An example would be Macbeth in Shakespeare, uh, Shakespeare's Macbeth. And then you also get the protagonistic uh, characters, the good uh, the main character is usually the good character in the story, often good or uh, uh, heroic. And uh, this character and the antagonistic characters, or these characters, because there can be more than one protagonist, they are, are in battle with each other. And if it's the, 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 the average story, it's usually the protagonist that reaches victory. Okay, on the protagonistic side, in terms of Lord of the Flies, the queer characters. One of the main characters is called Rolf. He's from the upper classes. We know that because of the language uh, and style that Golding uses to describe him. Rolf speaks a more upper class English. You can see that in his conversations with Piggy. Um, he's the one that is initially chosen as leader of the boys on the island. Um, and he can also be considered as the voice of order on the island up to a certain point. Then you've also got Piggy, um, I can when I don't could say Rarach and Omas, but now I'll know him Piggy. Uh, he's overweight. He is somewhat of an intellectual. I speak from a nerd. He's a talkative boy. Um, uh, he's the brains behind um, a lot, a lot of what Rolf uh, 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 thinks up his ideas and his innovations. Um, initially, the the uh, relationship between Rolf uh, and Piggy is a bit strained. Rolf actually kind of bullies Piggy uh, because of who he is. He's socially awkward and he's easily bullied as I said and he cannot see without his glasses. Okay. Ons weet hy kom van die laar klasse omdat sy Engels aansienlik verskil, sy Engelse dialek aansienlik verskil van die van Ralfsen. So ons kan uh, uh, dit ook uh, uh, sê. 
Uh, the important thing to remember about Piggy is he cannot see without his glasses and to keep that in mind as an image as well, as a beeld that is written in the book, but we will later on the detail of it. Okay, the other two characters that are part of the protagonistic side is Sam and Eric. They are twins, they are older boys on the island, and they are often referred in the book as one entity, one thing. And by the name of Sam and Eric, is what they are written in They are loyal supporters of Rolf, okay? They are easily excited, they regularly finish each other's sentences, and they often exist in a in a world of their own. And this should be key. This should be key. Um, Miss Proton, literally for comic relief. That's the first thing that happens. And then so, you know, when a snowy thing that happens, it's only spanning a bit to break. Typically, Sam and Eric is comic relief in the book, but they do play an important role at the end of the book uh, as well. Okay. The, on the antagonistic side, in other words, those that oppose the protagonists is Jack. Okay. He is in contention for the leadership of the boys at the beginning, but he's already the leader of the choir boys. He's a question, but I think no call it he says, but means as you see here, when a question is a good Okay, um, these choir boys eventually become the hunters. Uh, he is a, an egomaniac, okay, and he poses a threat to Rolf from the start. And he begins to say, he's very fond of the betrayal, but he's a little more. Uh, I do not only make a little good as so his character develops. Um, in, a, in opposing Rolf, he can be considered the voice of disorder uh, on the island. The important thing to know is he is still uh, from the upper class. Uh, although the English says white class person, that seems to be in any book. One of his main associates, associates, boss, is say, I'm part of the person that's a file that in is Roger. Uh, at the start of the novel, he appears quite drawn back, uh, but he is in actual fact a sadist. So he should be given a sadist. I hold off on um, 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 uh, grievelijke dinge to do, and we see this uh, as he reveals more involved himself uh, at, um, right throughout the novel. Uh, there isn't a specific class um, attached to Rolf, but he can fit uh, in either upper or lower class in terms of the English uh, class system. Okay. Then there is also someone that is in between, okay, and it's literally almost only the one uh, character. That character, uh, which I labeled him as part of the moralistic side, is Simon, okay. He exists not uh, with Rolf and not with Jack's group, not with the antagonists or the protagonists. Um, he understands the practices of morality, what it is om jedrig te wees, and I'm not going to say anything. Okay. He's got a good moral outlook, uh, and uh, within this context, um, he might appear a little. Uh, I like a beginner if it's not well, but in a secret sin, uh, a Simon, a good man, in a in a in a kind of life. I get what the real surround him, the same living as an I played or by. The other kind is get to fun or fun, but a little drive to fun or back. So Simon is uh, a typical example of the moralistic side uh, of. Lord of the Flies. Okay, other minor characters that which are collectively referred to, and what Simon did not advise, the biggins, uh, typically boys of about 11 or 12 years old, um, they symbolize people that um, support a leader that gives them power and material things. Okay, um, and then you've got the little ones, smaller boys, about five to six, they symbolize the only powerless people um, who suffer. Okay. Mens kan in sekere sin die antagonistische kant beskryf as die typisch die diktators wat die samenleving oorvat en waar hulle die opper gesag het. Ok, the next thing I'd like to move on specifically is themes in Lord of the Flies. Nou, as jy by jou semester optracht kom, gaan jy baie met themas en motieve werk, die vraag is ook so geform en leer, so it is a good idea that you are aware of what the themes are in Lord of the Flies, uh, what the motives are in Lord of Flies, the difference between themes and motives, uh, as well as how they play out, and you can explain them in uh, Lord of the Flies. Okay, firstly, what does the word theme mean within the context uh, of literature? Firstly, a theme is a message about life or human nature. Met ander woorde, dit is half, wat sê dit vir ons van die samenleving, wat sê dit vir ons, hoe ons ons self handhaaf as die mens? 
Dit komt natuurlijk terug, uh, of dit is natuurlijk niet met perspectieven. Uh, ons kijkt typisch dan aan die christelijke perspectief, maar dit valt niet met weinig binnen een bepaalde illusie. Het kan zijn outside of an ideology. Oké, okay. so um, if we uh, give uh, a practical examples of that, you look at the second bullet to typically be um, the story the author is writing that he uses as a comparison to discuss with you. Sure. Um, uh, uh, Golding had a theme of fun. Uh, he discussed the theme of evil uh, in Lord of the Flies and how evil happens within uh, humankind, which is supposed to, uh, uh, people are supposed to live in, in harmony with each other. That is basically, basically the themes. And he uses this story to discuss this theme. In most literature works, there'll often be a major theme, but there'll also be several minor ones. On that, this is a thing wat gebouw wordt. Die dak is wat alles bij mekaar hou, maar jy het die poote nodig rondom om die dak recht op te hou, die pilare of, jy kan maar huis ook as een voorbeeld gebruik. Ok, so the major theme would be the roof, and the sub-themes will be uh, the, the, the poles of the tent that supports, or, or the pillars of the house that supports uh, the roof. Ok, mys kan natuurlijk anders ook dan al kyk in term, as jy denk aan die fondatie van huis, waarop die huis gebouw is. It's a pretty cool example of theme. If we look at another uh, piece of literature, Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, the themes there are matrimony, friendship, love, and affection. Okay, but the major theme there is matrimony. But as you just said, there is a lot of the whole issue where a woman must be married for a for a for a certain age to be considered a spirit worthy of her accent. The minor themes we find there: love, friendship, affection. Etc. Ok, so dit gaan weer, wat is die groot idee, wat probeer die auteur in hierdie stuk uh, story, uh, die, of die, die vertelling van die story, wat probeer hy sê oor een bepaalde uh, thema. Ok, let's have a look at um, language and style again, um, I specifically put it there because that helps craft the theme as well. You've got the descriptive style, which is self-explanatory, uh, there's a lot of use of adjectives, um, it can be poetic in nature, and um, the um, the idea behind it is not to, just to give uh, uh, information. You get some descriptiveness in Lord of the Flies. When they first create it from the characters, then um, if we uh, uh, you've got of course that got the narrative style which we described as well earlier, but the descriptive style, ach, the narrative style is the main. Uh, style used by Golding. I think I can see this guy finished for a guy with excuse to offer. Okay, let's move on to the specific themes uh, that you find uh, in Lord of the Flies. Now, firstly, uh, as ons praat van a uh, gemeenskap wat real set, wat orde het, okay, we refer to that in English as a civilization. The whole thing behind being civilized is the fact that a group comes together, creates certain rules and a certain uh, order uh, in the group. Now, in Lord of the Flies, Golding shows how civilization is um, left behind because there's no rules to govern these children and how savagery takes over. Okay. This is directly done in the comparison between the two groups. So, I feel like the protagonistic group and the antagonistic group. Elke verteenwoordig tien ons gestelde kant. And um, by doing this, he questions of what has become of the world after uh, the war. Okay. The war in itself was the end of an era for many people. Okay. Again, if we look, if we think back to what Nietzsche said, and if we think back to um, uh, the uh, uh, much of Europe becoming atheist because of the war, there's the whole question of what things mean in this new world. Who's in charge? What will happen? How will it happen? And this is typisch what um, Golding to be aanspreek dier hierdie moendlike thema of civilization versus uh, savagery. They are said it as well, the comparison lies in the difference between the protagonistic side and the antagonistic side and what uh, they do. Ons sien dit ook op individuele vlak, dit is nie uh, specifieke uh, karakters. Ok, then we can also say about this, uh, nog een ding wat jy, uh, the, the, what you can call the theme is vice against virtue. Ok, um, as jylle sal ons heel kunde gereed het van Freud, uh, typies um, wat er, wat er uh, uh, gedragseindskappe um, is, uh, is, word jy my gebore en wat er gedragseindskappe uh, word vir jou geleer. Ok, 
What did civilization mean for these boys? Civilization basically meant the whole British um, home. Okay, they had food and shelter at this home. There was no wilderness of the island uh, where they had to struggle uh, even for their basic needs. Hulle was veilig. Hulle het school toegegaan. Hulle is geleer hoe om in hierdie samenleving uh, te oorleef of te leef. Uh, an example of this is Rolf, uh, where he wants to go back to the civilization. I said, I'm begin, I will hierdie type goed uh, 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 and one way that he does this in the novel is by creating a fire so that he can be rescued. We can um, say that this fire making as a, as a signal to show where you are comes from the Boy Scouts, which was created uh, just after the Second World War, if I'm not mis I'm mistaken. This is a bit ironic, okay, um, because the Boy Scouts learn how to survive uh, in the great uh, outdoors but only under the supervision of an adult. So Rolf had the instinct of what he had to and he made the fact that everyone can see, but it was not the use of the ouders in the eventual brand of the vote off. So that's one of the examples of civilization that we find. Then, um, to get back to the background of the, of the novel, um, this samenleving where the story of the story had a total chaos as um, evaporated into chaos. Okay, Rolf does not understand this. I see it not rock, I speak in naive that word, and I probeer out the situation, it comes here noch um, by going with civilization, what is learned uh, from um, uh, civilization. Another example that we see of this theme uh, in the novel is uh, the fact that there is a dem democratic vote about who is leader and who speaks when, and a symbol of this, a symbol of fun, is the conch toy. Um, skulp wat hulle gebruik het om net te blaas dat allemaal stil blij. Dit is een boel van orde in hierdie democratische samenleving onder um, and the civilization that they are trying to do. Savagery uh, if, we, if we move to the other side is related to violence and cruelty. It pitches itself against civilization and reason and chaos and disbelief and unreason and has uh, Im imagined enemies like for example the beast. Ons weet that, he, that he, the beast is not real in Lord of the Flies. It was created in the minds uh, of, the, of the boys and some took this further than they should have uh, and this is what happened uh, as well. Lord of the Flies then is typically an example of a struggle to build civilization in the absence uh, of a social norms. Now as you in here, op hierdie story, denk, hoe gaan ek enigszins hier oor ek som inskryf Hoe gaan ek sin maak wat ek hier so doen? Ek gaan vir julle later wees hoe ons dit by mekaar sit. Hierdie is nou maar net een bespreking van wat uh, ons in die boek vind. Ok, the next theme or possible theme, remember these themes are often related to each other, is man's inherent evil or the savageness that one finds in society. Order, we've said earlier, is related to democracy and civilization. Daar is order, daar is daar allemaal het te sê, some rules or laws are needed to help people work effectively together. Um, a voorbeeld daarvan in ons samenleving is bijvoorbeeld belasting, alhoewel belasting in ons samenleving misbruik word, maar dit is een van die, van die maatregels wat ingestel word om orde te skep. Uh, want allemaal die, neem deel, allemaal betaal belasting en allemaal behoor die vruchte van die belasting geld op te sien. An example in Lord of the Flies, uh, where man's in inherent evil is shown, uh, is the meetings with the conch. It weiss nou nie die, 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 die griebel self nie, but it show, shows that there's order, and this order is challenged in the novel, and eventually this inherent evil um, succeeds for a while. Okay. There is also, however, a danger of having too much order, and not allowing anybody the freedom to choose. That is ironisch genoeg. Um, order is een van die begrippe van democratie, maar as jy te veel orde het, he, kan jy nie democratie heen. Uh, en ons moet dit ook onthou, dit is in die sekere sin die fout wat Ralf uh, as karakter maak in die boek. Hy wil te veel orde hee en dan rebeleer mense en dan het jy die twee uh, tegenoorgestelde kante tegen mekaar. An example from Lord of the Flies on man's inherent evil. Jack makes a lot more rules than Ralph, but Jack's rules are meant to make the boys do what he wants, not to look after them. Okay, so there is a... a, a um, a reeling vir orde, maar nie orde vir die meerderheid mense nie, maar, of die, of vir alle mense nie, maar vir een persoon specifiek. 
this order, okay? With other words, chaos is related to chaos and savagery, corruption. What we typically see selves on the whole, as a cunt, refers to the temptation to act in a way that is not good. We learn an example there: refusing to act for the good of the group. And it is typically what Jack can do. Hij wil nie opperleier wees en hy, sy woord is wet. Um, en aan typische sy samenleving, his society creates corruption. Their order is based on uh, uh, corruption. Ok, so that, daar is nou so ver twee thema's wat ons bespreek het. Kom ons sluit in die tweede een af. Jack, at the start of the novel, is quite innocent. You'll, you'll agree with that. Hy is a bit pushy, I, maar hy is nie, hy is nie, he's not evil. Ok, his innocence is corrupted by power that he, that he gets, and this corruption causes him to become violent and cruel. He is a leader. Ons kan het by definitief sê, hy is a leier, maar hy misbruik sy mag dier die seens wat om nie ondersteun te straf. Well, in a sekere sin selfs dood te maak. Ok. People, en hier kom ons christelike perspektief weer in, can be both good and evil. Eindelijk is mense net, um, um, uh, people are only evil, but through uh, uh, our Salvation through Christ, uh, we can be good as well. The struggle between good and evil is shown in the novel through contrasting characters. I could feel a for daily the two kante, and that is hella what that work for the word. Okay, an example of this: Simon is good, while Roger is evil, and then also the way in which some characters act uh, badly. Jack, for example, becomes more brutal and cruel as the story goes on. And in Lord of the Flies, civilization and democracy repre represent values that are considered to be good, while corruption, savagery, violence and cruelty are evil. Here we can to spill the yield team of off, yield team of God off. This is here straight to see it Okay, that is very important with regards to that theme. If we move on to a third theme, okay, um, and that is talk a minute theme, okay, Maar uh, dit is ook iets wat ons moet onthou. The third thing that we could say, war and the future of mankind. Golding, and uh, we'll discuss those symbols later, um, uses many symbols, okay, om dit te verduidelik. Ons het vorig gepraat van de kans, die, die, die skulp wat hulle gebruik om allemaal met mekaar te roep. Um, some of these symbols we can regard as motives as well. I'll explain that to you later. Firstly, we've got the struggle between order and disorder. Ons het dit al in die vorige twee thema's bespreek. This order only results in war and ultimate destruction of mankind. It is important to understand chaos as this to understand. The island is a symbol of serenity. With other words, this is an ongerept island full of freedom and so on and so forth. It is not The island is destroyed by the end of the novel. So this shows that there is no more ongerept freedom. Okay. En die fysische eiland wat vernietig word, as gevolg van die um, vier, um, shows that uh, uh, this order has taken place here, and the influence of man only leads to destruction. Onthou jou perspektieve wat dit uh, betref ook. Want dit is typies wat, hoe die story uitspan, wat, wat um, Golding probeer uitwees, dat sodra die mens betrokken raak, het ons net met vernietiging uh, te doen. Then, a next minor theme that you um, should consider, uh, the end of rationalism. Now, you will more van rationalism leer uh, in your philosophy module, as you are sure that you are asking for one of the two of the Dr. Diedrichs, you can see exactly what um, uh, um, rationalism means. Um, the first example of rationalism, or where it is going, uh, is the fact that it is all rationele denken is by die deelheid as oorlog verklaar word. Die mense kan nie meer in vergelijking met mekaar kom, sonder om mekaar te moet uitmoor. Ok, so that's the first example of the end of rations. Then, the island itself, ok, is almost like a, um, a, 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 a symbolisch nou, a, a, a beacon of rationalism in a mad world, dit is baie belangrik om te onthou. Um, the fact that it's serene, that it's peaceful, is a symbol thereof. But, because there exists this um, end of rationalism, because of the war situation, um, the boys destroy this serenity. Okay, so daar gaan rationalisme ook by die deerheid. Then, the boys themselves are an example of uh, the end of rationalism. Okay, 
So, for example, well, not for example, we've said earlier that the boys come from a world of rationalism, but the eyes fall, that's where they come the course, they have a lot of the reals, learn how the samenleving to the best will of all plots. They uncorrupted until they get to the island. Okay. But they are only this until the end of the ach, until the start of the novel. By the end of the novel, they are victims of the end of rationalism. This belangrijk om dat hij daai perspektief ook te onthou. The other thing that Golding shows with the, with um, reference to this theme is that nature, ach nature, human nature is inherently evil. Okay, and the two beacons uh, fail. Hierdie uh, rationalisme is nie meer nie, want ons oorlog en die hele ding rondom geordende samenleving uh, is ook uh, by die dierheid. Then the last point I'd like to make on this, man is his own greatest friend and enemy. In as much as he created rationalism, he can destroy it too. So, rationalism, and good, we see it from a Christian perspective, we see it in the Bible as good. We have perceived sources in the way that we created rationalism, but we also know how to end it. Okay, and war is typically a, a way in which rationalism ends and chaos descends. So keep that in mind with that theme uh, as well. Okay, so I've mentioned one, two, three four possible themes to you. They are all connected in a certain sense. It is important to remember these things because if you want to know your themes, what does that mean? You can very easily write it because you can then the formula on yourself to clarify. I would just like to take a sip of water before I move on to motives. Now motives, let's first have a look at the definition. Motives are very similar to themes. But they are typically a dominant or a recurring idea that happen uh, within the novel. Okay, it could be an image, it could be a sound, it could be an action, it could be figures that have a symbolic significance for Van Lord of the Flies Fallers, and it ca and it always contributes towards the development of the theme. So, where where the theme of the 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 alles aan mekaar hou, is die motiewe, dit wat binnen die thema gehang word, as my sê so kan stel. Ok, there is a difference between motive and theme, as I said, it's a recurrent image, as ons die voorbeeld hier, byvoorbeeld van James Bond gebruik, een van sy bekende woorde is, as hy een martini bestel, it should be shaken and not stirred. That is typically something we associated, associate with the character of James Bond, it is a recurring motive, but the theme of each James Bond movie uh, differs from movie uh, uh, to movie. Okay, a typical example of a motive is the conch, die skulp wat hulle allemaal by mekaar roep. That is an example of the motive. Um, it represents reason. Okay, it represents democracy. Uh, en jylle sal ook sien, um, so draai aan die begin van die boek, as die leiding blaas, dan los allemaal alles. Uh, and everyone comes together, but as soon as it breaks, the island descends into complete chaos. You can it specific gaan kijk daar. Then another example of a motive uh, is the beast, or that die ding wat hulle geskip het. Um, it's an almost pagan-like figure that appears throughout the novel. Okay, pagan beteken um, a natuurlijke figuur. Um, nie, uh, if we speak of pagan religions, it's traditionele godsdienste. Um, but the fact is the beast doesn't really exist. Um, this is also an example that you can use. You can say this motive supports the theme of the end of rationalism. Um, the idea behind the beast is irrational. Exactly for the, precies for the fact that it didn't bestand. Okay. But this motive is used uh, to serve those that are power hungry uh, and to garner support. Ek het daar aandag hoor iemand praat van, it's an occupation of the mind. Die idee, jy raak so behep met die idee, dit is dit te domineer amper al vir jou leven. And it's typically what happens with the example of the beast. Then another example is the forest. From a Christian perspective, we can see it as the garden of Eden. En daar natuurlijk die associaties met die tuin van Eden, voor die sonde val, die mens is volmaak geskip, getrouw aan God en in dienst van God. Ok, ok. Until the fall to sin comes. Um, then the forest also provides, like the Garden of Eden, uh, with food in the form of fruit and pigs. 
Um, this work in the vote where Simon say um, when he makes his moral realization. Okay, um, that is that what Golding natuurlijk bevraagd ik in any book. But Simon is the character that makes his realization about what moral, mor morals really are about. And Simon is of course the moral character. Like it's very very like say I bought me by the antagonists of the protagonists account. Before Simon was killed, this is a belangrijk moment here. He emerged from the forest, the last place of moral ration and rationality. So he devote and himself the forest is seen as a motif or a motive. Things go from bad to worse when the forest burns down. Okay, the whole idea of the build of the vote is there. definitely for motif. Then there's also the scar in the forest. Now, as you book read it, you will come that the stick of the vote was unlikely to be burned. And it looks like a a a roof beneath the of of a little bit beneath the vote. But that's not the point we're after. It's closely linked to the forest. Is it is a motive that almost foreshadows. We're going to look at what foreshadow of later. Look at what foreshadowing is. That that foreshadows actually what's going to happen. Okay, it goes grows bigger and bigger throughout the story because the children need more wood to make the fire. It could also be a symbol or a motive of the decay of the small society of the boys. And as things go from bad to worse, the scar becomes bigger until eventually when the whole forest burns down. Okay. Another motive that we find in the in the novel is Piggy's glasses. And you like it feel it's very said to Piggy as character bespreak. Piggy is uh, of the lower class, but he's rather intellectual. To a certain extent, Piggy's glasses is a window into his world, a window into the uh, intellectual world, the world that, uh, that has got rational plans to save the boys from this situation. Piggy immediately becomes lost when he doesn't have his glasses. Okay, uh, His glasses and his, his uh, intellect uh, we can also associate with rationalism and democracy. But there's also an irony to his glasses. He is too naive to see the world outside his glasses. The world, what omdat hij zwak ziende is gebleur is zonder zijn bril, die wereld wat chaos vertegenwoordig. Als die een lens in zijn bril breek, it becomes a foreshadowing of what will eventually become his fight. Oké, okay, hij wordt door het gemak uh, en dan coronatie ons altijd zei die lens in zijn bril is gebreek. En dit is dan ook symbolisch van the end of rationalism, the end of intellectualism, uh, and the end of democratic rule on the island. That is very uh, important uh, to note. So, that motif van sy bril kry sien ons ook telkens dier, dier uh, die boek. Ok, I'm going to end today's discussion there. Volgende week gaan ons net na paar extra um, uh, 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 um, uh, look at a couple of extra literary terms. Wat ek vir jy gaan uitwees in die, in die, in die roman. Um, and then we'll also start discussing about how we analyze this um, uh, um, novel. How we integrate themes and motives and language and style and all those kind of things. Um, dit is vir my belangrijk. Ek het juist hierdie twee leer ene de geïntegreerd weer aanbied. Dat ons bykie meer tyd het om aan die fysische skryf van die, of hoe jy jou, jou analyse opstel gaan skryf, kan spandeer. Indien daar enige vraag is, um, en dit nie persoonlijk van aard is nie, kan jy naar die forum toe gaan op je klas, um, en jy kan daar vraag vraag, uh, ek wil dan, ek gaan daar probeer antwoord ook, en ek wil ook jy, jy kyk of jy mekaar uh, kan help. Ek hoop jy middag is lekker, tot ziens.